Section six of Jataka Tales by H. T. Francis and E. J. Thomas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Robbers and the Treasure. Once on a time, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, there was a Brahmin in a village who knew the charm called Vedabha. Now this charm, so they say, was precious beyond all price for if at a certain conjunction of the planets the charm was repeated and the gaze bent upwards to the skies straight away from the heavens there reigned the seven things of price gold silver pearl coral cat's eye ruby and diamond in those days the bodhisattva was a pupil of this brahmin and one day his master left the village on some business or other and came with the bodhisattva to the country of seti in a forest by the way dwelt five hundred robbers, known as the Dispatchers, who made the way impassable. And these caught the Bodhisatta and the Vidhabha Brahman. Why, you ask, are they called the Dispatchers? Well, the story goes that of every two prisoners they made, they used to dispatch one to fetch the ransom, and that's why they were called the Dispatchers. If they captured a father and son, they told the father to go for the ransom to free his son, if they caught a mother and her daughter, they sent the mother for the money. If they caught two brothers, they let the elder go. And so, too, if they caught a teacher and his pupil, it was the pupil they set free. In this case, therefore, they kept the Vidabha Brahman and sent the Bodhisatta for the ransom. And the Bodhisatta said with a bow to his master, In a day or two I shall surely come back. Have no fear. Only fail not to do as I shall say. Today will come to pass the conjunction of the planets which brings about the reign of things of price. Take heed, lest, yielding to this mishap, you repeat the charm and call down the precious shower. For if you do, calamity will certainly befall both you and this band of robbers. With this warning to his master, the Bodhisatta went his way in quest of the ransom. At sunset the robbers bound the Brahmin and laid him by the heels, just at this moment the full moon rose over the eastern horizon and the brahmin studying the heavens knew that the great conjunction was taking place why thought he should i suffer this misery by repeating the charm i will call down the precious rain pay the robbers the ransom and go free so he called out to the robbers friends why do you take me a prisoner to get ransom reverend sir said they well if that is all you want said the brahmin make haste and untie me have my head bathed and new clothes put on me and let me be perfumed and decked with flowers then leave me to myself the robbers did as he bade them and the brahmin marking the conjunction of the planets repeated his charm with eyes uplifted to the heavens forthwith the things of price poured down from the skies the robbers picked them all up, wrapping their booty into bundles with their cloaks. Then, with their brethren, they marched away, and the Brahmin followed in the rear. But as luck would have it, the party was captured by a second band of five hundred robbers. "'Why do you seize us?' said the first to the second. "'For booty,' was the answer." if booty is what you want seize on that brahmin who by simply gazing up at the skies brought down riches as rain it was he who gave us all that we've got so the second band of robbers let the first band go and seized on the brahmin crying give us riches too it would give me great pleasure said the brahmin but it will be a year before the requisite conjunction of planets takes place again if you will only be so good as to wait till then, I will invoke the precious shower for you. Rascally Brahmin, cried the angry robbers. You made the other band rich offhand, but want us to wait a whole year? And they cut him in two with a sharp sword and flung his body in the middle of the road. Then, hurrying after the first band of robbers, they killed every man of them, too, in hand-to-hand -hand fight and seized the booty. Next they divided into two companies and fought among themselves, company against company, till two hundred and fifty men were slain. And so they went on killing one another till only two were left alive. Thus did those thousand men come to destruction. Now when the two survivors had managed to carry off the treasure, they hid it in the jungle near a village, 
and one of them sat there, sword in hand, to guard it, whilst the other went into the village to get rice and have it cooked for supper. But true is the saying, and greed is verily the root of ruin. He who stopped by the treasure thought, When my mate comes back, he'll want half of this. Suppose I kill him the moment he gets back. So he drew his sword and sat waiting for his comrade's return. Meanwhile, the other had equally reflected that the booty had to be halved, and thought to himself, "'Suppose I poison the rice and give it him to eat, and so kill him, and have the whole treasure to myself.' Accordingly, when the rice was boiled, he first ate his own share, and then put poison in the rest, which he carried back with him to the jungle. But scarce had he set it down, when the other robber cut him in two with his sword and hid the body away in a secluded spot. Then he ate the poisoned rice and died then and there. Thus, by reason of the treasure, not only the Brahmin but all the robbers came to destruction. Howbeit, after a day or two, the Bodhisattva came back with the ransom, not finding his master where he had left him, but seeing treasure strewn all round about, his heart misgave him that, in spite of his advice, his master must have called down a shower of treasure from the skies, and that all must have perished in consequence. And he proceeded along the road. On his way he came to where his master's body lay cloven in twain upon the way. Alas! he cried, he is dead through not heeding my warning. Then with gathered sticks he made a pyre and burnt his master's body making an offering of wild flowers. Further along the road he came upon the five hundred dispatchers, and further still upon the two hundred and fifty, and so on by degrees until at last he came to where lay only two corpses. Marking how of the thousand all but two had perished, and feeling sure that there must be two survivors, and that these could not refrain from strife, he pressed on to see where they had gone, so on he went till he found the path by which with the treasure they had turned into the jungle and there he found the heap of bundles of treasure and one robber lying dead with his rice bowl overturned at his side realizing the whole story at a glance the bodhisattva set himself to search for the missing man and at last found his body in the secret spot where it had been flung and thus mused the bodhisattva through not following my counsel my master in his self-will has been the means of destroying not himself only, but a thousand others also. Truly, that they seek their own gain by mistaken and misguided means shall reap ruin, even as my master. And he repeated this stanza. Misguided effort leads to loss, not gain. Thieves killed Vedabha, and themselves were slain. Thus spake the Bodhisattva, and he went on to say, And even as my master's misguided and misplaced effort in causing the rain of treasure to fall from heaven wrought both his own death and the destruction of others with him, even so shall every other man who by mistaken means seeks to compass his own advantage utterly perish and involve others in his destruction. With these words did the Bodhisattva make the forest ring, and in this stanza did he preach the truth while the tree divinities shouted applause. The treasure he contrived to carry off to his own home, where he lived out his term of life in the exercise of almsgiving and other good works. And when his life closed, he departed to the heaven he had won. Great King Goodness once on a time, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Benares, the Bodhisattva came to life again as the child of the queen, and on his name-day they gave him the name of Prince Goodness, Silava. At the age of sixteen his education was complete, and later he came at his father's death to be king, and ruled his people righteously under the title of the Great King Goodness. At each of the four city gates he built an almery, another in the heart of the city, and yet another at his own palace gates, six in all, and at each he distributed alms to poor travellers and the needy. He kept the commandments and observed the fast days. He abounded in patience, loving kindness, and mercy, and in righteousness he ruled the land, cherishing all creatures alike with the fond love of a father for his baby boy. 
now one of the king's ministers had dealt treacherously in the king's harem and this became matter of common talk the ministers reported it to the king examining into the matter himself the king found the minister's guilt to be clear so he sent for the culprit and said oh blinded by folly you have sinned and are not worthy to dwell in my kingdom take your substance and your wife and family and go hence driven thus from the realm that minister left the Kasi country and entering the service of the king of kosala gradually rose to be that monarch's confidential adviser one day he said to the king of kosala sire the kingdom of benares is like a goodly honeycomb untainted by flies its king is feebleness itself and a trifling force would suffice to conquer the whole country hereon the king of kosala reflected that the kingdom of benares was large and considering this in connection with the advice that a trifling force could conquer it he grew suspicious that his adviser was a hireling suburn to lead him into a trap traitor he cried you are paid to say this indeed i am not answered the other i do but speak the truth if you doubt me send men to massacre a village over his border and see whether they are caught and brought before him the king does not let them off scot-free and even load them with gifts he shows a very bold front in making his assertion thought the king i will test his counsel without delay and accordingly he sent some of his creatures to harry a village across the benares border the ruffians were captured and brought before the king of benares who asked them saying my children why have you killed my villagers because we could not make a living said they then why did you not come to me said the king see that you do not do the like again and he gave them presents and sent them away back they went and told this to the king of kosala but this evidence was not enough to nerve him to the expedition and a second band was sent to massacre another village this time in the heart of the kingdom these two were likewise sent away with presents by the king of benares but even this evidence was not deemed strong enough and a third party was sent to plunder the very streets of benares and these like their forerunners were sent away with presents satisfied at last that the king of benares was an entirely good king the king of kosala resolved to seize on his kingdom and set out against him with troops and elephants now in these days the king of benares had a thousand gallant warriors who would face the charge even of a rut elephant whom the launched thunderbolt of indra could not terrify a matchless band of invincible heroes ready at the king's command to reduce all india to his sway these hearing the king of kosala was coming to take benares came to their sovereign with the news and prayed that they might be dispatched against the invader we will defeat and capture him sire said they before he can set foot over the border not so my children said the king none shall suffer because of me let those who covet kingdoms seize mine if they will and he refused to allow them to march against the invader then the king of kosala crossed the border and came to the middle country and again the ministers went to the king with renewed entreaty but still the king refused and now the king of kosala appeared outside the city and sent a message to the king bidding him either yield up the kingdom or give battle i fight not was the message of the king of benares in reply let him seize my kingdom yet a third time the king's ministers came to him and besought him not to allow the king of kosala to enter but to permit them to overthrow and capture him before the city still refusing the king bade the city gates be opened and seated himself in state aloft upon his royal throne with his thousand ministers round him entering the city and finding none to bar his way the king of kosala passed with his army to the royal palace the doors stood open wide and there on his gorgeous throne with his thousand ministers around him sate the great king goodness in state seize them all cried the king of kosala tie their hands tightly behind their backs and away with them to the cemetery 
There, dig holes and bury them alive up to the neck so that they cannot move hand or foot. The jackals will come at night and give them sepulcher. At the bidding of the ruffianly king, his followers bound the king of Benares and his ministers and hauled them off. But even in this hour, not so much as an angry thought did the king of goodness harbor against the ruffians. And not a man among his ministers, even when they were being marched off in bonds, could disobey the king so perfectly as said to have been the discipline among his followers. So King Goodness and his ministers were led off and buried up to the neck in pits in the cemetery, the king in the middle and the others on either side of him. The ground was trampled in upon them, and there they were left. Still meek and free from anger against his oppressor, King Goodness exhorted his companions, saying, let your hearts be filled with naught but love and charity, my children. Now at midnight the jackals came trooping to the banquet of human flesh, and at sight of the beasts the king and his companions raised a mighty shout all together, frightening the jackals away. Halting, the pack looked back, and, seeing no one pursuing, again came forward. A second shout drove them away again, but only to return as before. But a third time, seeing that not a man amongst them all pursued, the jackals thought to themselves, These must be men who are doomed to death. They came on boldly, even when the shout was again being raised. They did not turn tail. On they came, each singling out his prey, the chief jackal making for the king, and the other jackals for his companions. Fertile in resource, the king marked the beast's approach, and, raising his throat as if to receive the bite, fastened his teeth in the jackal's throat with a grip like a vice. Unable to free its throat from the mighty grip of the king's jaws and fearing death, the jackal raised a great howl. At his cry of distress, the pack conceived that their leader must have been caught by a man. With no heart left to approach their own destined prey, away they all scampered for their lives. Seeking to free itself from the king's teeth, the trapped jackal plunged madly to and fro, and thereby loosened the earth above the king. Hereupon the latter, letting the jackal go, put forth his mighty strength, and, plunging from side to side, got his hands free. Then, clutching the brink of the pit, he drew himself up and came forth like a cloud scudding before the wind. Bidding his companions be of good cheer, he now set to work to loosen the earth round them and to get them out, till with all his ministers he stood free once more in the cemetery. Now it chanced that a corpse had been exposed in that part of the cemetery, which lay between the respective domains of two goblins, and the goblins were disputing over the division of the spoil. "'We can't divide it ourselves,' said they. "'But this King Goodness is righteous. "'He will divide it for us. "'Let us go to him.' "'So they dragged the corpse by the foot to the king and said, "'Sire, divide this man and give us each our share.' "'Certainly I will, my friends,' said the king. "'But as I am dirty, I must bathe first. "'Straight away by their magic power the goblins brought to the king "'the scented water prepared for the usurper's bath.' And when the king had bathed, they brought him the robes which had been laid out for the usurper to wear. When he had put these on, they brought his majesty a box containing the four kinds of scent. When he had perfumed himself, they brought flowers of divers kinds, laid out upon jeweled fans in a casket of gold. When he had decked himself with the flowers, the goblins asked whether they could be of any further service, and the king gave them to understand that he was hungry. So away went the goblins and returned with rice flavored with all the choicest flavors which had been prepared for the usurper's table. And the king, now bathed and scented, dressed and arrayed, ate of the dainty fare. Thereupon the goblins brought the usurper's perfumed water for him to drink in the usurper's own golden bowl, not forgetting to ring the golden cup, too. When the king had drunk and had washed his mouth and was washing his hands, they brought him fragrant beetle to chew, and asked whether his majesty had any further commands. "'Fetch me,' said he, "'by your magic power, the sword of state which lies by the usurper's pillow.' And straightway the sword was brought to the king. 
then the king took the corpse and setting it upright cut it in two down the chine giving one half to each goblin this done the king washed the blade and girded it on his side having eaten their fill the goblins were glad of heart and in their gratitude asked the king what more they could do for him set me by your magic power said he in the usurper's chamber and set each of my ministers back in his own house certainly sire said the goblins and forthwith it was done now in that hour the usurper was lying asleep on the royal bed in his chamber of state and as he slept in all tranquillity the good king struck him with the flat of the sword upon the belly waking up in a fright the usurper saw by the lamplight that it was the great king goodness summoning up all his courage he rose from his couch and said sire it is night a guard is set and doors are barred and none may enter how then came you to my bedside sword in hand and clad in robes of splendor then the king told him in detail all the story of his escape then the usurper's heart was moved within him and he cried o king i though blessed with human nature knew not your goodness but knowledge thereof was given to the fierce and cruel goblins whose food is flesh and blood henceforth i sire will not plot against such signal virtue as you possess so saying he swore an oath of friendship upon his sword and begged the king's forgiveness and he made the king lie down upon the bed of state while he stretched himself out on a little couch on the morrow at daybreak when the sun had risen his whole host of every rank and degree was mustered by beat of drum at the usurper's command in their presence he extolled king goodness as if raising the full moon on high in the heavens and right before them all he again asked the king's forgiveness and gave him back his kingdom saying henceforth let it be my charge to deal with rebels rule thou thy kingdom with me to keep watch and ward and so saying he passed sentence on the slanderous traitor and with his troops and elephants went back to his own kingdom seated in majesty and splendor beneath a white umbrella of sovereignty upon a throne of gold with legs as of a gazelle the great king goodness contemplated his own glory and thought thus within himself had i not persevered i should not be in the enjoyment of this magnificence nor would my thousand ministers be still numbered among the living it was by my perseverance that i recovered the royal state i had lost and saved the lives of my thousand ministers verily we should strive on unremittingly with dauntless hearts seeing that the fruit of perseverance is so excellent and therewithal the king broke into this heartfelt utterance toil on my brother still in hope stand fast nor let thy courage flag and tire myself i see who all my woes o'er past am master of my heart's desire thus spoke the bodhisatta in the fullness of his heart declaring how sure it is that the earnest effort of the good will come to maturity after a life spent in right doing he passed away to fare thereafter according to his deserts. End of section 6